Basically, said, I'm a Deputy Secretary with the Department of Industry, Innovation, Science, Research and Tertiary Education. It's clearly a department with a very narrow focus, given that title. Um, and um, it does have a broad range of responsibilities and perspectives. Uh, we serve a number of ministers and parliamentary secretaries. And one of the um, things we've tried to do in the department is bring the perspectives of skills and tertiary education together with industry and innovation policy. Some of my colleagues have already spoken to you, in particular Mark Cully, who's the chief economist there, and in the panel later you'll hear from Robin Tree, who's the head of the Australian Workforce and Productivity Agency. I think for many people, productivity is often a byword for longer hours and tougher pay and conditions. And explaining the value of productivity and reforms to improve productivity isn't, isn't always straightforward. And, and, and it reminded me of an article I, I saw in The Economist, which noted that um, the American public were less likely to support an issue if it was supported by an economist. And in fact, typically the consensus issues that economists supported, say for example the impact of the American Stimulus Program, which had a consensus among, economies, uh, among economists, I think of over 90%, sort of less than 50% of the American public agreed with the consensus of economists. So uh, I suppose, given the recent experiences of many in the United States, it's not that surprising there's not a whole lot of trust in the consensus that arises out of the economic discussion. But even given that, uh, my sense is even here in Australia, um, the consensus around economic policy, particularly around what might be described as Australia's long-term economic reform program, is not well understood and probably not widely appreciated outside of policy circles. Okay, again, maybe that's something we can talk about in, in the panel. And, you know, to be honest, this is despite very clear evidence of rises in productivity, lifting the purchasing power of consumers and enhancing the profitability of businesses and, in, and improving our material wellbeing more broadly. So, in my talk, I'm going to briefly examine the Australia's economic context and recent trends in productivity outline a very simple framework for thinking about uh, for the way we might think about productivity and policy, explore some of the competing explanations for recent trends, and finish with a discussion about innovation and skills and productivity given the focus, uh, given the focus of my, my department. So I think it's pretty well known that the re-emergence of major Asian economies is accelerating long-term trends in the changing structure of the Australian economy and perhaps more than any other advanced uh, economy. And the sustained increase in prices for our mineral exports has generated the longest and largest increase in the terms of trade since the gold rush of the 1850s and has contributed about half, as this chart shows, uh, of the annual increase in Australia's gross national income per person over the course of the, of the 2000s. The mining, the mining boom and the uh, persistent high dollar have also brought many new challenges to regions in certain parts of the economy, particularly for those sectors competing in non-mining exports and for import competing industries. And this chart, uh, which appeared in a speech some time ago given by Phil Lowell of the Reserve Bank, illustrates uh, the stark difference that, that different industries face for real product wages, where this is simply the, 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 the wage in industries deflated by the output of, of those industries. So this is a really large structural change being uh, forced through the economy, as you know. But at the, and at the same time, this is all going on, we've witnessed the slowdown in labour and multi-factor productivity, and that's what's fueled concerns uh, in the policy community about Australia's future prospects for sustained and sustainable uh, income growth. And, and chief among those is the concern that the boost to Australian incomes from this record recent high terms of trade may have masked an underlying erosion in the productivity of either of some parts of Australian industry, or, or perhaps even more widely, and once the terms of trade uh, stabilises as, as, it, as it has and, 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 and as it may fall, you won't, you'll no longer get that contribution to income growth and potentially, uh, and you will, get a detraction. And moreover, this comes at the same time as downward pressure on labour force participation, perhaps something that uh, Robin will re return to, to um, uh, later. So let me illustrate that quickly with a, with a couple of slides. I'll come back to the concepts later. Multi-factor productivity in the 12 industry market sector of the economy didn't seem to grow at all in the last um, complete products, uh, productivity cycle compared with growth averaging 2.5% in the late 90s. And in the current incomplete cycle, productivity of growth appears to have turned negative. Labour productivity grew at an average annual rate of 1.6% over the last complete cycle compared with 3.7% in the late 1990s. Now it's it's not uh, all gloom in the statistics. You can always find a story to suit uh, 
um, your, your story, or certainly that's how I felt when I used to work in Treasury. Uh, the annual measures of multi-factor productivity are only available with a lag, so often what people turn to, to to sort of see what's going on more recently is uh, quarterly movements. And some recent data on labour productivity is more encouraging with uh, labour productivity in the market sector growing at 2.9% in the most recent financial year. And just a very si simple statistical analysis of trying to pick out trends, obviously um, a simple-minded one, but just to try and illustrate that shows that there has been um, since about 2008, um, labour force productivity growth of around 1.9%, uh, which is a little stronger than our 40 year average of 1.6%. But I probably don't have to tell anyone in this room that we have to be pretty careful in interpreting these statistics, but at least they're suggestive of, of a turnaround. And that turnaround might be consistent with some of the explanations that we'll, that we'll come back to, um, to uh, shortly. So as I said, over the past few years there have been many studies of productivity and, and uh, we have an institution called the Productivity Commission which has a, has a clear focus on all, on, on all of these things. And, and all of these studies begin with a quick, a quick exploration of what we mean by productivity. And this is, uh, I'd like to do that now and then just use this organising principle um, and hopefully it'll prove useful in the panel discussion. So, as you know, productivity is essentially a measure of how many goods are produced or services provided for given levels of input. And so the simplest measure is the ratio of outputs to inputs. And when our capacity to produce more outputs rises with the same inputs, productivity uh, increases. And so you can think of uh, productivity as the maximum output, um, or, or you can think of the technological frontier or, the, or um, as much as you could get as the maximum output you could produce for different quantities of, of inputs. And this is often called the technological frontier or the production, production possibility curve. So this is how I want to think the organising principle I want to use. Effectively, there's a, a, a technological frontier that grows over time and that's effectively globally determined. And then uh, um, Australia is really not, is not going to determine that frontier, but for a range of reasons um, might be proportionate to that frontier and and a lot of policy, a lot of policy discussion in Australia focuses on how close we can, how how we can improve the internal productive efficiency of the economy to get our economy as close as possible um, to the frontier. So, I mean, a number of people have looked at this issue. They often use the United States as the benchmark, benchmark or the proxy for the global um, uh, technological frontier, if you like. And analysis done at Treasury, for example, has shown that Australia is typically between, being between about 75 to 85% of the US's productivity level. In other words, we can't get to the frontier, and there are some good reasons why. There may be some good reasons for why we can't get there. Um, but once, if you like, that relationship settles down, uh, productivity growth in Australia will largely be determined by how fast that frontier grows, and that will be determined by <coughs> global invention and, and new, um, new production processes. But it's worth thinking, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but it's, um, it's worth um, cons considering that, that proportionate relationship. So as a simple example, if in Australia it takes five years to diffuse the ideas that are driving best practice in other countries, and so for example Australia is five years behind the global frontier as set out by the US and US productivity growth rate was about 2%, that would see the productivity gap in Australia our productivity level 10% below that of the US's. And that's, uh, and in those circumstances, that's a substantial loss of income and a substantial loss of income per person. And so understanding why you're not at best practice or why you're not at the productivity frontier is, is probably um, pretty useful. Now let me now turn to, um, um, turn back to, with that framework in mind, uh, some of the uh, explanations for the recent slowdown in productivity. So here now I'm going to talk about three sets of explanations for why we saw that very, that, and that um, MFP turn negative and that big, um, and a slowdown in labour force, pro in labour productivity, I beg your pardon, and, and also give you my take on where we've been falling out on those. So the three sets of explanations go something like this. First, there's a number of studies that attribute most of Australia's recent slowing in productivity, mostly multi-factor productivity, to a combination of um, the unrequited surge in capital investment, mainly in utilities and mining, with the uh, output yet to come through, the impact of the drought on agriculture, and other factors such as capacity constraints during a cyclical upswing, fluctuations in capacity utilisation, and changes in industry structure. So in summary, uh, 
The slowdown is predominantly driven by a set of largely one-off factors, which it's therefore reasonable to expect that at least some of this slowdown will reverse as some of these one-off factors are, are, are unwound. And, that, and such an explanation may be consistent with some of the recent pickup we've been observing in, in productivity. Now, that's not to say um, that many of those studies and many of those analysts don't note that there may be other broader factors at work. It's just they put the balance of the explanation on these, uh, on, on, on these one-off factors. There's a second set of arguments, and, and that is that the slowing in measured productivity growth has been more brace, broad based than sister, and systemic, and then can be explained by the special circumstances. And this is probably the, the, the uh, arguments that Saul Eastlake and Marcus Walsh were putting, and they, these people um, emphasise the need for pressing on with economic reforms with a focus on workplace relations, removing regulatory constraints, reviewing sector specific assistance and fine tuning other framework conditions to, to drive productivity improvements. Now having said that, these were all, I guess the economists are all in furious agreement, the people in the first set of arguments um, are quite comfortable to pursue all those reforms, it's just not where they find uh, the explanations for the current slowdown. And maybe a third argument, a third set of arguments is that what we're observing in productivity statistics are predominantly issues of measurement and many of the movements are not especially meaningful. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, and perhaps an element of this sort of argument is that the broad productivity trends we've observed in Australia have been observed globally. There was a speed up in productivity in the 1990s, though Australia's speed up went beyond that. There was a slowdown in the 2000s, though Australia's slowdown went beyond that. But broadly speaking, these are movements consistent with whatever's going on in the global frontier. So, my reading of these various analyses sees me, uh, I favour the first set of arguments. Though I think there's, there's, there's useful points in all three. But I, I think this would be a, uh, an element, I know it's an area, for example, that one of the um, panel members, Quentin, has spent some time on and, and that we can come back to to see how much of these factors might be one-off or how much be, might be um, uh, more enduring. For the rest of my talk, though, I'm, pro I'm not going to talk so much about the gy gyrations because uh, obviously productivity is a long-term enduring uh, concept and in, and in the longer term we want to think sort of about what might drive Australia's productivity or what might be part of Australia's productivity over the longer term. But again, with, if you like, a simple framework in mind, if you expect it, is that will largely be limited by how fast the global frontier is moving. And then the question for policy makers is how fast, you, how close you can get to that, to that frontier. Before I do that, I thought I'd just mention a paper um, which I found very interesting about prospects for the global frontier. Uh, it's a recent paper by Robert Gordon where he's outlined some of the reasons for why productivity in the US as the global productivity leader may not grow as strongly in the past. Uh, and in particular, he's argued that, um, this is a very long term, um, he, he's argued that um, uh, some of the um, um, rapid progress we've observed over the last 250 years could well be a somewhat of a unique episode. And then, he talk, and then he talks to the specific circumstances that the US faces. This is obviously pretty speculative stuff, but it does remind us it's worth always thinking about how fast the global frontier is likely to move and what's likely to drive it. So let's now turn to um, what might move Australia uh, closer to the global productivity frontier. And usefully, usefully for us, from policymakers, we've seen a very valuable contribution in this area recently from Gary Banks, where he's identified the top 20 policies to lift productivity, and I can um, sorry to recommend that speech to he, but he's identified it in three channels of government influence. Incentives, capabilities and flexibility. So around incentives, we should focus on enhancing competition and improving regulation so as to minimise the distortionary impact on business and maximise effectiveness and promote healthy competition, both domestic and foreign, to support productivity through, um, through the link to the pursuit of profits. Around capabilities, a focus on developing skills and human capital, improving management practices, strengthening the innovation system and ensuring that adequate and efficient provision of infrastructure. And thirdly, on flexibility, around the flexibility of product and, import, and, and input markets. Uh, I'm going to focus mainly on, um, on capabilities um, in a moment, uh, what Gary called capabilities. But I thought it would be worth also drawing your attention on a recent paper by David Gruen, 
who highlighted the significant influence of resource reallocation on productivity growth, um, which comes from the turnover of firms as they enter and exit industries and redirect their resources and efforts towards higher uh, product, productive activities. And David and um, Ben, his co-author, have emphasised that firm turnover can be a significant force in productivity growth, even in periods of strong economic growth, and especially in the early years of new operations. Uh, and their paper suggests that up to one half of labour productivity growth could potentially be attributable to changes in industry composition. And I'll, I'll, I'll try and come back to that when I start to talk about um, uh, innovation. And finally, uh, just another piece of research to fill that part of the story out is a paper some time ago by the Productivity Commission and the Bureau of Stats, which show that increased competition is associated with increased innovation. And um, um, given the pressure, at least that we hear coming through our door at the industry department, around the high dollar. There's no doubt there's substantial competitive impetus, impetus being, ex, being um, put to trade exposed uh, sectors of the economy at the moment. And while, again, while one can only speculate, that, that may well be an additional um, uh, factor behind um, what may drive an increase in labour productivity, particularly in those, in those sectors. And now, I now want to just, turn, just finish up with uh, a brief discussion around uh, innovation, uh, skills, intangible assets, and, um, uh, and, and some um, concluding comments. So uh, let me turn to innovation and sort of uh, perhaps uh, start with a, a quick little story. When I moved to the uh, uh, Industry Innovation Science Research and Tertiary Education Department from areas such as um, uh, climate change and uh, treasury, where all your problems seem so well defined and concepts so crisp, um, it, it is interesting now working in an area where, frankly, I'm pretty sure if I asked you all for a defini definition of innovation, you'd all give me a slightly different one. And, and no one knows quite what it means, or often quite what um, the government's role is in promoting it. But it is definitely an area worth working with. And there's, as Gary Banks has said in the past, innovation is clearly synonymous with productivity. And so, even though there's a bit of, frankly, fluffiness I found around some of the concepts and many of the pathways between innovation and productivity are poorly understood, it's an area where there's well worth us paying, I think, some attention. So, what would I, so what's a working definition of innovation? Well, in broad terms, I think it can mean the implementation of a new or significantly improved good or service, process, new marketing method, or new organisational method in business practice, workplace organisation or external relations. So what it's not is just a new piece of kit or a new invention. It's, um, it may well be um, around adoption of, um, of, of ideas or changes in, um, in business practice. So it's, it's clearly a, um, a, um, a broad concept. The ABS has done a couple of useful um, surveys around this area and, and they've certainly found, at least as an association, that innovation active businesses are nearly twice as likely to report an increase in productivity compared with the previous year when averaged across business sizes. And they've also found across a range of business performers in performance indicators that innovation active businesses report higher performance than non-innovation active businesses. Now obviously this is all self-reported and we have to work out what's innovation active and what's non-innovation active, but there's clearly um, um, uh, something going on here. Now, interestingly, on most international comparisons of innovation, using these same sorts of concepts, Australia does reasonably poorly. A recently published OECD study summarised these findings, stating that Australia falls short on international best practice on critical dimensions of, in, of innovation. And the central dimension of that is uh, collaboration, where Australia has relatively low levels of collaboration among business and among businesses and researchers. And to illustrate that further, the department's innovation system report shows that Australia has, is, the, is fifth from the bottom on national and international collaboration on innovation by firms, the lowest level of collaboration on innovation activities for large firms, and low levels of business collaboration with higher education or government research institutions, especially for large firms. So I'm always one um, to be careful about these cross-country studies and exactly what they mean and what they mean for us for policy and we should be cautious in interpreting them. But nevertheless, at the very least, there seems to be a good case for trying to understand what's going on in Australia compared to other places and whether, for example, the extent to which Australian businesses collaborate with researchers is suboptimal and that leads to a lower productivity level than it, than it otherwise uh, would. But the other... Um, Two dimensions, as I said, that Gary raised in the capability area, 
were, or well, one, sorry, were skills in particular. Now, I'm not going to say much about that because I think Robin will have a chance to uh, talk about that in the, in the panel discussion. But it is, there is very good evidence that an educated and skilled workforce is essential for successful innovation, and particularly in the adoption of new ideas and their diffusion across the economy. Um, strong technical skills in trades and design um, may well be, well, are, are necessary for creating and developing and diffusing new technologies and processes. And clearly, management skills are needed to adopt and adapt um, innovation. As I said, um, there's, there's always been um, plenty of evidence around about higher levels of education, increasing productivity and earnings for individuals, um, um, with a number of studies looking at those issues. Um, of course, um, that doesn't mean we should just spend more on education, but, but I think um, I'll, I'll leave it uh, in pursuit of productivity. Um, clearly there's a set of very important policy questions there, but I'll, I'll uh, perhaps let Robin talk about that. The last area I wanted to talk about, which frankly is new to me, but it's one my department has um, spent some time thinking about, is the role of what people call intangible assets. Currently the OECD is conducting a project called New Sources of Growth, Intangible Assets. Uh, uh, and this project aims to provide evidence of the economic value of knowledge-based capital and new sources of growth. And, uh, and so, for example, this chart shows investment in physical capital and their best estimates of investment in intangibles as a proportion of uh, gross domestic product by, a, ra by, by a, um, a range of countries. And it shows, again, at least by people's best guesses, that the proportion of investment in intangible capital is quite high, particularly in, say, the in places like the United States and Sweden. And Australia actually has always had a relatively high proportion of, um, of uh, physical capital investment which, and, and a high rate of savings, but we have a relatively low rate of investment in tangible capital as, as defined here. Now, part of that story may well be our industry composition, but part of it may also be, um, uh, it may reflect something suboptimal around the way our market works or competition and, and the way collaboration and innovation arises. Uh, uh, across the um, uh, across the economy, using these types of data, there's been a number of growth accounting studies, and they've clearly shown a positive relationship between business investment in knowledge-based capital and and productivity um, change. And uh, my best guess is they are representing a, a, an important advance and an, an interesting new area uh, around understanding productivity. And so my department's been working with the Melbourne Institute to update our modelling on the contribution of intangible variables to productivity growth. And I should note that this is something the PC's also looked at in the past and found to be a, a significant issue. I'm just going to um, finish up with a few points and then uh, come back to the um, paper that Christopher was talking about earlier. Much of my um, discussion today has quickly sk um, skated across policies that are effectively trying to get Australia closer to the global technological frontier. But that's not to suggest that we have no role in expanding that frontier or, shoot or should free ride on the efforts of others. So um, while we're not able to get to the frontier in all sectors, we can push it in a small number of strategic areas that are key to our long-term interests. <coughs> and the Chief Scientist Ian Chubb's currently leading a process designed to focus research on tackling five societal, environmental and economic challenges. And uh, in motivating this exercise, the Chief Scientist has um, published some international comparisons of Australia's citation rights to shed light on Australia's research quality. And these comparisons suggest Australia is at best at developed country averages, but well short of best practice. The key message from the Chief Scientist is that the notion that Australia punches well above its weight when it comes to research quality is not, is not right. Um, that at best we're around average and we're well short of the research quality particularly achieved in a number of, of European countries. So those sorts of comparisons um, would seem to echo some of the comparisons that, we were discuss that I've been discussing on uh, innovation and collaboration. And the chief scientist is responding to this by trying to focus the efforts of Australian research on areas that may reflect comparative advantage and, um, and national priorities. And again, as, um, as a, uh, a person spending a fair bit of time in Treasury uh, coming into uh, a set of policies where there's a lot of direction at the centre, which is what's going on in research, is often a kind of a challenging um, prospect. But there's significant amounts of public money spent around education and research in Australia and a clear focus on where they're being directed uh, rather than a... Um, um, letting a thousand flowers bloom um, seems at least a prospect worth um, considering. 
So, just to, to wrap up, um, there's much we know about what generates productivity, both globally and in Australia, but clearly still that we don't know. And, and the range of explanations for the recent movements in productivity estimates, I think, illustrates the difficulties in measurement, let alone interpretation. When we move on to facets like innovation and skills and measuring how they impact on productivity growth, it becomes especially challenging. Um, understanding how firm-specific human capital or a firm's network affects productivity growth is much harder to estimate than the impacts from physical capital or, or hours worked. And many of these measurement difficulties arise because many of the features of innovation and skills that are important for productivity growth are knowledge-based or they have these intangible characteristics um, that I was talking about. But I do think this is an area that's well worth us talking about and spending more time understanding, especially with capital deepening unlikely to deliver the same sustained growth in labour productivity that it did in the 20th century. I'd suggest that we need to better measure, analyse and understand the policy settings around these areas that may well generate the new sources of multi-factor productivity growth and technical logical change in the, in the 21st century. Finally, I'd just like to draw your attention to a new attempt to carry forward the dialogue on productivity. Some colleagues of mine from the Department of Innovation, Industry, Science, Research and Tertiary Education have published a synthesis paper to support the policy discussion around productivity and, and promote, hopefully, coherent considerations. Um, mm. As part of our work, we often grapple with these matters, and so this paper is an attempt to share with you um, some of the issues we, we see, particularly around measurement issues, but some of the policy issues. And I'd particularly like to, to thank the departmental officers who drafted it, um, Stan and, um, and, and Lai, and I'd also like to thank uh, Richard Snabel and, um, and some of my other colleagues from the department. And lastly, I'd, I'd like to thank um, um, those who contributed it from outside, including Professor Quentin Grafton, uh, Christopher and, um, and Dean Parham. And I recommend you have a read of the paper. It's a good paper in an otherwise crowded field, but well worth having a look. And lastly, thank you very much for your time today.